Good morning or good afternoon, and thank you very much for attending my talk, and thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work. I want to discuss a paper that I'm finishing now with uh, Azimin Arvanitaki at Perimeter and Savas Dimopoulos at Stanford, and three excellent students in Stanford, Marius Galanis, Olivier Simon, and Jet Thompson. And the topic is the degradational production of dark sector. The search of dark matter uh, is one of the main quests for cosmology and high energy physics. And we have by now evidence from all galactic uh, scales, from uh, galactic scales to intergalactic scales and cosmological ones. And all of this evidence actually comes from gravitational interactions. Now though, the searches for dark matter rely on, usually rely on other interactions with the standard model, like direct detection, collider searches or astrophysical searches. And uh, we really have no idea about which one is the right candidate. And the production mechanisms offer an interest, very important benchmarks for experiment, experimental searches in terms of masses and couplings. And uh, the, the landscape of possible candidates is really broad here and sketching it in a very schematical way. Uh, and I put in the first line a few candidates that's that are particularly motivated by other problems of particle physics. And the other boxes refer to other very interesting candidates, either for the production mechanisms or for the uh, possible detection channels. And the, uh, most of the production mechanisms that are present in this slide actually rely on non-gravitational interactions. And um, I would like to stress that, uh, I mean, as it was already known, uh, gravity by itself can play the game of producing the dark matter uh, in pair with inflation. Uh, by now, it is quite widely accepted uh, as a successful paradigm, the one of primordial inflation, for its many postdictions and predictions about cosmology. And uh, in inflation, there is a time there in the ground, there is a large Hubble rate, and the moles, after leaving the Hubble radius, stay frozen and their amplitude then is conserved. All of these ingredients make inflation an excellent moment uh, for particle production through gravity. And actually, this represents an unavoidable contribution. And this production could actually account for the wall of dark matter. This is not a new observation, of course. And um, let me uh, get now in this slide to summarize um, three different uh, ways of seeing and understanding gravitational production, each with their own virtues and, um, um, and advantages. And this topic has been studied since the 50 or 60 years ago, actually. So uh, the first way I would like to describe it is uh, as follows. If a quantum field uh, lives in a time varying background and its energy, omega, as a function of time, varies much faster than the energy itself. So if omega dot is larger than omega squared, then we are in this so-called non-adiabatic regime. And uh, what was an initially outgoing wave eventually become an admixture of in and outgoing waves. And this corresponds to particle production. And the time dependence for the frequency that we need for this production to occur can come most notably from the mass term or from, from other terms. For a scalar, for example, uh, the, even without a mass, uh, there is a time dependence that gives rise to this particle production. A second way to describe the, the same mechanism uh, borrows more the language of quantum field theory, and it's probably the, the more robust uh, way of describing it. And it relates to the violation of scale invariance. This corresponds formally to the fact that the energy momentum tensor has a non-zero trace. And this implies that the diagram that you see in this box is non-zero. So there is a non-zero amplitude for producing pairs of particles from initial state of gravity. And uh, this scale invariance uh, is the key symmetry that needs to be violated in order for this process to occur. And actually, it relates to something very intuitive. Uh, that is the fact that the equations of motion of a field can, made be, can be made time independent or not. 
if there is a rescaling of the field itself and of the metric that allows to get rid of the scale factor, then the, um, the equation for the field can ultimately, ultimately be made time independent. Whereas if you cannot do these rescalings, then uh, you have time dependence and you get this particle production. Finally, a third way that is also commonly cited, although it's a more informal analogy from many points of view, is the one of describing the, the sitter space as a thermal space with a temperature that is given by the Hubble rate over two pi. And uh, being a thermal state, it comes with a buff of particles uh, with a temperature of that order. This is actually an approximate analogy. We should keep this in mind because, for example, uh, it doesn't tell us which particles couple to this buff. And we know from the previous two points that these are the particles that violate scaling variance. Although, nevertheless, it can be an interesting analogy uh, for many physical phenomena. And uh, the take home message from this slide is actually pretty simple for the rest of the talk. It's the fact that at the rise and exit, the energy density that is stored in a given mode is of order Hubble inflation to the fourth for a scalar or a massive vector. Given that the longitudinal degree of freedom of the massive vector is just a scalar. Or for a fermion, where the scaling variance violation comes from the mass, we have a mass squared suppression. So the energy density will be n squared hi squared. So pre previously, people have considered the possibility of getting the dark matter that we see in the universe today from the gravitational production of one species of particles during inflation. In particular, about 20 years ago, uh, Kolb, Riotto, Chang, and collaborators studied the, um, the possibility of uh, one fermion composite of dark matter. And in that case, the mass of the fermion has to be close to the inflationary scale, and in any case, not below something like 10 to the 10 GB. Um, another scenario that was studied way more recently in 2015 by Graham, Mardon, and Rajendran is the one of a longitudinal, um, a scalar, sorry, the longitudinal degree of freedom for a massive vector. If you have a massive vector, then it can be substantially produced during inflation. And in this case, instead, we point to the low mass range towards 10 to the minus 5 electron volts. But now, what about possible interactions in the dark sector? Let's say that it's still just one, the particle that is mostly produced during inflation. But what if it has some interactions that allow this energy density to be reprocessed later in the cosmological evolution? And in order to address this question, we study in our project one of the simplest scenarios we could conceive, that is massive dark QD. So we have one fermion, psi, that is the dark matter, and one vector, A prime, whose longitudinal degree of freedom is gravitationally produced during inflation. And I will describe uh, soon the cosmological evolution for this sector. And we'll see that adding a minimal level of complexity in the dark sector opens new benchmarks for, for detection. So it will be useful to quickly review the, um, the story that was studied in the paper by, in 2015 uh, of the vector dark matter, when we have just a vector and nothing else, in order to see how the story changes when we include the Fermi. So the, uh, it will be useful to look at this plot where I'm showing uh, co-moving scales in, on the vertical axis as a function of time. So for a fixed mode K, we have an horizontal line that you see in purple. And in blue, you see the uh, conformal Hubble radius. This is decreasing during inflation. And uh, when the mode leaves the uh, Hubble radius, uh, its energy density is order Hubble inflation to the fourth. Then the amplitude for this mode freezes while it is super horizon. When the mode re-enters the horizon later during the radiation domination phase, uh, it starts to oscillate. During the super horizon phase, its energy density was scaling as a to the minus two, and its energy density mostly came from the mass term in the Lagrange. Then the, uh, oh, sorry, I know this is a type, but there is a square in the mass there, of course. When the mode crosses the horizon then, 
the, uh, the most starts to oscillate and uh, it behaves as a relativistic degree of freedom. The energy density goes as eight to the minus four. And at a time when the Hubble rate H is equal to MA, the mass of the vector, all the modes start to oscillate, even the ones that are still above the, uh, beyond the horizon. And uh, those modes will go as a to the minus three, and also the sub-horizon modes, when they cross the Compton wavelength, the green line, they will scale as a to the minus three. Now, why did I bother so much about what are the scalings with time and so on? Well, because this analysis allows to compute the, um, the energy density for this mode and its power spectrum. Now, let us get to our scenario. So the, uh, this model we consider in our project is, as I said, massive dark QD. So on top of the vector, the massive vector A prime, we include one fermion, uh, the would-be electron in QD, uh, psi, that couples to this dark vector with a charge E dark, ED. And in this talk, I will just focus on the case when the fermion is much heavier than the vector. Uh, and in the paper, we also consider the other case. So what is, in a snapshot, the cosmological history for this sector? We have uh, the vector whose longitudinal degree of freedom gets gravitationally produced during inflation. The production of the fermions is negligible during this time. Then the A prime modes are frozen while they're super horizon. Nothing is happening until now. And then when the modes re-enters the horizon, uh, there is a world-rich phenomenology that I will quickly summarize in the next slide. And the longitudinal degree of freedom produces the uh, transverse modes and the fermions. Then uh, there is a reprocessing and there is a thermalization of the dark sector. And eventually the dark sector will get to a temperature that is smaller than the standard model one by the square root of Hubble inflation of M Planck. And eventually there will be a freeze out and uh, Psi will become the dark matter candidate while the uh, energy density in the vector will be negligible. And the favored mass range for Psi then, the selected one from this story is GV to 10 TV. And it has a mild dependence on the Hubble rate during inflation. Let us see in a slightly more detailed way, what is the cosmological history? So uh, the beginning of the story goes as, the, as what we saw before. During inflation, the A prime gets mostly produced. And when they cross the hover radius, they stay, their amplitude stays frozen for some time. And then when it crosses the horizon, the mode A prime starts to oscillate. This generates strong electric fields. Uh, there are strong electric fields because the occupation number of this vector is very large. So there are these um, uh, large effects. And let's remember that given that we deal with longitudinal degree of freedom, the magnetic field is negligible instead. So when in the Hubble patch, we have now these large electric fields and uh, this leads to the, this lead to the creation of pairs of Psi and Psi bar from the photons that are entering the horizon. And uh, in a quite short amount of time, at some point, the uh, production of these fermions and transverse photons uh, leads to a plasma of particles that screens partially the electric field. So we enter now a regime um, when one could study in detail the evolution of the uh, plasma in the electric fields, something that we do in our paper, uh, and the, the outcome is that uh, if the coupling E dark is large enough, then at some time there will be full thermalization in the dark sector. So also the longitudinal degree of freedom, the A prime L will thermalize with the Psi and the transverse. And this happens through diagrams like the ones you see here. So the, with this diagram, the longitudinal degree of freedom converts into a transverse one by scattering on a fermion. And important processes are number changing processes like this one, because the, uh, we need to decrease the number density, the large number density of 
vectors we have at the beginning to get to a thermal state. Then uh, once we have this thermal bath of particles in the dark sector, which is decoupled from a standard model bath, at some point, there will be the standard result story. When Psi, the dark matter, becomes non-relativistic, uh, then the, um, the annihilation processes will freeze at some point, and Psi will, uh, its abundance will freeze out, just as in the standard WIMP story. And um, again, in this way, we compute what is the, um, for which values of E dark and masses you get to the right abundance of dark matter, and this is the result. So I show here on the vertical axis the uh, charge E dark, and on the uh, lower axis you see M psi, and the green line is the uh, parameter space for which you get the right abundance of psi as dark matter. And uh, you see with red colors the lines that mark where thermalization in the dark sector happens. Above this line, uh, you have an efficient chemical equilibrium in the dark sector. And above this other line, you have instead kinetic equilibrium. So this line can definitely be trusted here and most likely also in this region. Uh, then below this line, we cannot anymore trust our simple calculations and we would need some numerical simulation of the system out of equilibrium system to understand where you get the right abundance. Um, and the, uh, the parameter space that leads to the right abundance is also safe from constraints on long range interactions uh, for dark matter. Uh, so this is the story still without including any interaction with the standard model. But actually in these scenarios, it is pretty natural uh, that some coupling between standard model and dark sector can come out. Uh, this takes the form of this uh, kinetic mixing where the, there is a small number epsilon uh, coupling the F mu of the dark vector with the F mu of the standard model photo. And a convenient basis to study this model is one where we have the diagram we had before. So the psi's interact with the dark photon and also the standard model particles interact with the dark photon with the suppressed charge epsilon times E, the electromagnetic key. So these interactions offer a handle for dark matter detection, uh, for direct detection and also astrophysical uh, searches. And not only this, they also offer a production mechanism via freezing. So this diagram allows for the leakage of some energy from the standard model into the dark sector. And even if this epsilon is tiny, over cosmological amounts of time, you can get enough energy in the dark sector so the psi can be the dark matter. And this mechanism had been known for a lot of time and points to a specific parameter space. So here in this plot you see on the vertical axis the product of epsilon times the E dark and on the horizontal axis still the fermion mass. And these are various uh, astrophysical and direct detection constraints. And the horizontal line that you see here is the prediction from freezing. And you see that in green is what we can populate with our scenario, with our model. So uh, with gravitational production we, uh, of some vector and a consequent evolution in the dark sector, we can get Psi to be the dark matter in this whole range. And uh, the, this box is slightly shifted to the, to the right if you modify the Hubble during inflation. Um, that's all for all I wanted to say. Let me very quickly summarize. So uh, the production mechanisms for dark matter are very useful to study because they offer benchmarks for direct detection. And the most economical of them is gravitational production that only relies on gravity and inflation. And this generically leads to populating the dark sector with a temperature that is below the standard model one. And it is the one written here in the slide. And the, uh, adding a minimal structure in the dark sector can open up new benchmarks for direct detection as I showed in the previous plot. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to discussing with you soon.